Hi, welcome to Bookmark. I'm your host, Don Noble. Today's guest is Birmingham writer Keith Thompson. Thompson is the author of several spy novels, thrillers, but most recently has written a study of pirates in the late 17th century in the Caribbean and on the west coast of Panama. I spoke with Keith Thompson in Studio UA in the Digital Media Center on the campus of the University of Alabama. It's nice to see you again. It has been a long time. We did a show together, what, how long ago? 20 years? I think, I think Nixon was still president. <laughs> it, was a, it was a very long time ago. And at the time, you were, you were writing uh, thrillers and spy, spy books. Uh, but it's been so long, in fact, that I'm sure the audience does not remember your biography. You've driven here today from Birmingham but you're not an Alabamian, not really. Um, where were you raised? Where, what did you do for a living? Where did you go to school? I grew up in Connecticut. I went to Columbia in New York. And um, what was the other question? What did I do for a living? Yeah. I uh, largely worked as a screenwriter uh, in California um, before sort of finding my way into writing books. An awful lot of people work there, work for decades to get to be a screenwriter in California. <laughs> you did that and left it. What, what, what was the motive for, for thinking that there was something else <clears throat> that you wanted to do? Well, I was working on a movie for Paramount. Um, I probably shouldn't have said Paramount. Just keep it between, you know, <laughs> yourself and the audience. Uh, and I was, I'd replaced a writer who'd been fired, who'd replaced a writer who'd been fired, and, and so forth. And I had a meeting where 12 or so studio executives were giving me feedback on the last draft of a, a script, uh, of a screenplay. And um, it, it was really, you know, kind of weird comments, but nothing terribly unusual and frankly for what they were paying me I would have happily cleaned the men's room. I was happy to have the job and it was a fine meeting as those things go. But when I was walking out to the parking lot afterwards my agent happened to be there and he said, you know, if you write a book they'll never change anything and it'll get made. And I was staying in Los Angeles that night in a hotel. I was living upstate in Palo Alto, California. And I went on the internet and I saw that there was an adult education course at Stanford University starting in a couple weeks in writing novels. So I signed up and the first project I worked on became my first book, Pirates of Pensacola, which was published in, I don't know, sometime around when uh, Carter was president. <clears throat> Have any of your books been made into movies? Not yet. Uh, the I mean, spy novel that'd that be an I, interesting circle, wouldn't it? Right. The spy novel that I uh, first, I think, uh, talked to you about way back when I, is is uh, maybe sort of possibly going to be made right. into one. Right. I was talking with the Harry Cruz, who's gone now, but Harry Cruz wrote a dozen novels, and <clears throat> and uh, he said that I asked him if he, none of them was ever made into a movie. They should have been, and they may still, but they weren't. And I said, what, do you, what would you think about that? I said, what would you think about the changes they would make in your novel when it went on the screen? And he'd say, oh, that's not my novel up there. My novel's in the library, and I want the money. <laughs> and so it all worked out very well. <clears throat> well, I know your work for the last <clears throat> many years as, well, the titles give it away. You know, uh, they're... They're spy novels <laughs> and, and, and thrillers and, and uh, whodunits and of a sort. This is a nonfiction book about <clears throat> not pirates at large, but a very particular bunch at a particular time. But, but I learned a lot about pirates, and, and that made me think, well, I didn't know much, and other people don't either. What's the difference? Is there a difference between the 
pirate and the privateer? Because you make that distinction early in the book that these guys are trying to label themselves. They're trying to be, look, be a, thought of as privateers. Right. So I'm terrible with the dates. You know, I write for escapism and I forget everything afterwards. Uh, but uh, around the time that these, this, this crew set out, uh, which I think was 1680, yeah. uh, England and Spain were relatively at peace. These guys are mainly English. Yeah. Uh, when England and Spain are at war, the English government would give people licenses to pirate, basically. That made them privateers. Um, our guys in this story didn't have a license, so they were basically pirates. They pretended, though, <clears throat> to be on a... I think this is odd. There was a, a, a little... an Indian princess who had been kidnapped, and they were, they were trying to sell the idea, generally, that they were doing a humanitarian good deed to go and rescue this woman from her captors. But it's all bogus, right? Uh, I think that they genuinely wanted to rescue the princess. She's a member of the Kuna, an indigenous tribe in Panama. Um, they wanted to rescue her from the Spanish uh, who had taken her captive and were using her as a sex slave, or so they thought. Uh, for I, I think they were gentlemen in, in some sense. Uh, it also had a lot to do with the fact that the garrison where she was being held captive oversaw a large gold mining operation and they stood to make a fortune. Oh, the fortunes that get talked about in, in your book are wonderful. <clears throat> a moment. Should anyone shed a tear or have any spasms of sympathy for the Spanish, everything that, that one reads suggests they were just awful, cruel, bloodthirsty, greedy. You got, is, is that, does that work for you? Uh, it's tough to generalize. There are uh, some good Spaniards, but it's, it's relative. Um, one of the overseers of the mine in, in this book, um, a young woman, came to him and she said, I can't go into the mine to work today because I, I just had this baby. And she had the baby with him, with her because she, she didn't have childcare. And the, the Spaniard, the mine overseer, uh, took a look at the baby and uh, took the baby from her and slung it into a rock and cracked its skull open. And he said, problem solved, go to work. And I, I don't think that that really was that much of an outlier in the way that the Spanish treated the indigenous people, particularly in Panama. Yeah, and they weren't all that wonderful in Peru or elsewhere. How, in the course of this, of this story, you make reference to several contemporaneous accounts. Did, I never think of pirates as literate, particularly, as writers, but apparently certain number of people involved in in all of this wrote wrote their histories wrote their memoirs and you read them yeah a funny thing happened uh in 1670 something uh <laughs> i think um a guy named uh, alexander exquamelon uh wrote a book called history of the buccaneers of america and this guy was a surgeon and he'd uh been with uh captain henry morgan's crew and the book was uh, massively popular in Europe, uh -huh. and it inspired a generation of educated gentlemen to go seek adventure and fortune as pirates. Uh, three of them happened to be members of this crew. They wrote about their experiences. Um, and. That's what drew me to the book, the, the first one. It's just really cool. Like, pirates don't generally write memoirs or diaries or anything because it, it, would, it would be evidence against them in a trial, especially if they're not privateers and these guys weren't. So it's a real singular uh, source material treasure trove. My, my first guess would not have been that they didn't write memoirs because it could be used against them. My first guess would have been that they were all illiterate. Right. Well, there was that, too. <laughs> yeah. I, I think that... The, the three that, uh, you know, educated guys probably represented about, you know, one-third <laughs> of the 
literate pirates and a crew of 360. <laughs> yeah. They, where did pirates come from? Did, did, I mean, one hears about being a person being shanghaied, or I guess into the British Navy as well, but also were people, uh, were young men taken against their will? Were they adventurers? Were they ex-sailors? Who, who, who became a pirate? If you're sitting um, around in London or Liverpool or somewhere, can you become a pirate? I, I, they, they certainly were Shanghai. I don't think any of the 360 or so uh, in this crew were Shanghai. Uh, the vast majority of them were English seamen, sailors on merchant ships and in the Navy who were frustrated with the class consciousness, the hierarchy, mm -hmm. uh, and the whip-happy captains at the top of it and at the, at the top of the hierarchy. Um, uh, a lot of them are just criminals who had no other choice and were desperate to make money somehow. A lot of them were escaped slaves. The pirates were um, really quite uh, welcoming of, of all sorts. Um, and then the, 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 the three main characters of, of this book were educated gentlemen who yeah. thought it would be cool. So a pirate ship was diverse. Absolutely. In its own... 17th century way. About uh, 35 of the members of the crew were not English. Everybody else was English, uh -huh. just in this particular uh -huh. case. Well, not only did they have a, uh, a, a nice uh, spread of ethnicity, they were also, one of the things, another thing that stands out is apparently they were given to voting and democracy and the will of the majority and so on. I, when I read that, I thought, really? And they had meetings and they voted on things. Yeah, uh, absolutely. The pirates were democracies ahead of their time. This crew was no exception. They would write out uh, contracts for uh, how, how they were going to uh, conduct every mission. And any time that there was any sort of deviation from the, the course, they would take a vote on it. So what, what we would have thought of in Hollywood terms as a mutiny was actually a, a vote of no confidence. They would meet and vote. <laughs> right. Uh, these guys were uh, floating soap opera. They had a lot of mutinies. They weren't this sort of uh, knife uh, or blade to the throat affair that, that you, you think of. It, yeah. it was just sort of a vote of no confidence like in British Parliament. So if they thought the captain wasn't doing the job right, they would vote him out of office. Right. The other thing that, I, that they seemed to vote about was they would vote about whether to, literally to attack a Spanish galleon or not, or to attack a fortified town or not. They just about always voted to attack, sort of the way a dog, uh, when he sees a bouncing ball, that, that was, that was a, a, an easy vote. Right. Well, yeah, one could have predicted the vote, but... All right. Still, I mean, it's it's consent. It's a it's a, a group effort. The other thing that that I thought was <laughs> unknown to me was they had a kind of a, 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 a not quite a life insurance plan, but a but a workman's compensation plan. <laughs> and I don't know. You you say that some of these numbers escape you, but if they went into battle. And a pirate lost his left arm, he was given 500 pieces of eight. If he lost his right arm, he got 600 pieces of eight. Same for legs. Eyes and fingers were worth 100 pieces of eight each. <laughs> well, that's better than we were doing now. Huh, right, and you, you would probably know better than me <laughs> since you read the book more recently what 100 pieces of eight is worth, but I think it's basically like a guy's... A typical workman's, uh, like on a plantation, salary for what a year? Well, it's it is it is interesting. A, a, um, a farm worker might make a thousand a year. Um, uh, but but when these pirates stormed a, a town that had a treasury in it, or they captured a galleon. They would get like 50,000, 30,000, 50,000, 75,000 pieces of eight. And 
247 pieces of eight would buy you a farm and 12 cows. So the, the amount of loot was enormous. Well, if you're a sort of scallywag or a scoundrel or an escaped slave, this, uh, you know, joining one of these crews represents the opportunity, a singular opportunity for you to really have, uh, you know, the American dream before there was an American dream. Well, the dream was to go back to England and buy a farm. Right. But I, I'll bet, and I think, I think you imply this, and if, if not explicitly, certainly it's in there, that very few ever made it back to England with the money to buy the farm. Um, these guys uh, did pretty well. They, I think that they did wind up with enough money to buy farms in the Caribbean, if not uh -huh. England. However, many of them, uh, as soon as they got to port, gambled it away, uh, in some cases within a couple of days. I, the statistics on drinking are just marvelous. I mean, that, that you, you mentioned that, that a, a pirate might get to port go on a bender and spend a thousand pieces of eight in a few days, enough to buy three farms <laughs> or whatever it is. What did they, what did they drink every day? I mean, what did, pirates, yo-ho-ho -ho and a bottle of rum and all that, but did they, how much did they drink in the way that we imagine they did? You know, the book has a lot of statistics, which of course have long since fled my mind about drinking, but I'm pretty sure that the standard ration on a, a British naval ship at the time was a gallon of beer plus uh, some measure like a half pint of yeah. whiskey. Yeah. And I, I, I think that the pirates really had no limits. Um, and certainly in the case of uh, this mission into Panama, they there were a lot of times as some of their attack plans uh, suggest that they were drinking way more than that gallon of beer. Oh, God, yes. And, well, who would tell them not to? I mean, who, would, who, was, who was in charge? Uh, this, your, your narrative, this, this particular expedition is odd because m most, of, uh, bu most of the buccaneers were in the Caribbean. But this gang learned that in the town of Panama, on the Pacific coast of Panama, right. there was treasure, and also there were Spanish ships loaded with treasure on the west coast of Central America. So they walked, basically walked and took canoes across the isthmus. That is a harrowing, that, in, in, your, in your book, I mean, my God, snakes, poisonous trees, the insects, it was deadly just to get from where they were to, to begin their, their piracy. They, um, wh whatever possessed them to, these are seagoing people. When they crossed that land, they were a mess. One of the literate pirates, uh, a guy named William Dampier, who actually really wanted to be a botanist, and he saw piracy as a way to go around the world and see new plants and animals. Uh, he, in a capture of a Spanish ship, a mail ship in the Caribbean, read the Spaniards' concern, the colonists' concerns that the Pacific uh, port cities were horribly unguarded, that the defenses were in a woeful state of disrepair. Well, yeah. Uh, and he uh, brought this to the captains and they decided, well, why don't we go down there? And no pirates really had gone down there, no English pirates, no pirates at all for that matter, just because you have to go all the way around the continent past the, right. you know, all the way near Antarctica to, to get back into uh, the Pacific. So what they decided to do was walk across the Darien Isthmus, which is the near the Panama Canal. It's about a 10-day yeah. hike if you manage to not get attacked by the various snakes and jaguars. <laughs> and yeah, thousand dollar, uh, th sorry, thousand pound anaconda. Right. And, and crocodiles and, and, and even trees that will kill you. I thought that was amazing. 
the trees that, where the bark was so poisonous. If you accidentally rubbed up against it, you're likely to get killed. Right, yeah, I should remember the name of that one. It's like the manganeal apple. I, I think if you eat it, you will die a slow death over six months or so. And that happened to one of the oh, pirates, dreadful. despite repeated warnings not to eat the apples, no matter how hungry you got. Pirate ships were, well, let me talk, let's, these pirates didn't go through basic training. These were not United States Marines. But you talk about them as very skillful fighters. Marksmen, excellent with the sword, excellent with the, with, with the what was a, a musket, I presume. Right. How, how, did they train? Did they practice? They, they, had, they were better than the people they were fighting against, right? They were really... Uh military superheroes, they had cutlasses and they used those in close quarter combats, but in Buccaneers' hands, uh, especially at that period of time, the uh, musket was like a magic wand. They trained with it all the time. Uh, part of their standard mission agreement was to find people, I forget the amount, maybe 50 pounds or 20 pounds if they, right. or pieces of eight if they didn't keep their musket clean. Right. Um, they were constantly practicing, they were all, all sharpshooters and that was their huge advantage. That was how a small pirate crew could defeat a Spanish man of war with 500 soldiers on it. And the pirate ship, this one, and but, but in general, they were much smaller than the Spanish galleons. Right. Uh, they used uh, smaller sloops uh, for maneuverability and quickness. They'd go in, do a surgical strike, and, and get out. Or they would go in, do a surgical strike, and take the Spanish galleon with them. I, I, there are scenes in the book where the pirates are in, in smaller, more maneuverable, quicker ships. They come up within what is their range of the Spanish and then shoot the, the Spanish off their deck or off out of the rigging and, and, and so on. I mean, they were, they were really, really talented warriors, these guys. Right, and Panama City, which is then called Panama, um, uh, 36 pirates in five canoes took on three galleons that had 200 some experienced soldiers and managed to outmaneuver them. It's probably the, I mean, it's arguably the greatest underdog oh, it's, yeah. victory in maritime history. And they did not wear high boots. They did not wear boots, uh, not, not until like 1925 and, <laughs> and, and on the Paramount <laughs> studio lot as yes. it happened. And they did not say R, <laughs> probably. No, they, uh, that, that wasn't one of them. They, they did say uh, Jose a lot. A lot of people <laughs> think it's pronounced Jose, but evidently they said Jose as in hooray. And, and, and at least saving a little bit of lore if a pirate got ashore and he got drunk and he was rich, he might have a parrot or a monkey. <laughs> right. Uh, Dampier, the botanist, uh, before he fell in with the Panama crew, he was uh, in a crew that he, he actually made his fortune stealing a bunch of parrots. They were really valuable in uh, Europe at the time. And, and he bought himself an estate with it in, in England. One more, one more thing that, I, that, I, that impressed me, well, in the sense of I don't want to be there, <laughs> is that even when there was no fighting going on, sailing from place to place was fantastically dangerous. They would get headwinds, ocean currents, drought, scurvy. I mean, if they never went into battle, half of them would die anyway. Right. Uh, there's a statistic, and I think I, you know, may have like gotten it off the internet, and it might be wrong <laughs> that scurvy killed more pirates than navies. Uh, however, that maybe that's storms that killed more pirates than navies. But scurvy was a huge killer, and that did afflict uh, these guys when they just got stuck in doldrums uh, out in the Pacific, which is just no wind. They, no. they had no way of getting provisions. No, there was just one bunch. They they, they took them days and days and days to. Well, they didn't go ten miles a day. They were just right. stuck, and they ran out of everything. When there's no wind, you basically the ship becomes an iceberg. It just they just they, sit they, there about, until the same speed. Till the water runs out, till the food runs out, and they didn't know yet about limes and citrus and so on. I don't guess yet. That is a really a 
slightly later development. Right. Well, it was very, it's a very exciting business being a pirate, but also high risk. <laughs> anyway, you, after several, um, well, escapist, should we say, novels, spy novels, thrillers, you have this nonfiction book. And what happens next? Um, I, I really like uh, this kind of escapism. It's, uh, you really put yourself into somebody else's problems and <laughs> you don't have to really, uh, it, it's, it's really fun. I'm gonna write another book uh, that will come out uh, a year from now about uh, Sir Walter Raleigh's attempt to find El Dorado, the golden city in South America. Uh-huh. And will you be doing any more fiction? Uh, I, have, I suppose you will, but... I have another, uh, an, an Alabama-based uh, heist thriller uh, in the works as well. I remember uh, s several books ago of yours in which there was a tiny spy drone that someone was looking out his bedroom window, and this thing that looked like a m hummingbird was right outside, and you're 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 a technological minded person, aren't you? Um, you know, I don't even remember that scene. But uh, in, in Once a Spy, um, there was a device. One of the spies uses, like I think it was a it was before even iPhones. Or it was an iPhone that could deliver a I don't know million volt shock to to somebody, and I got just so much. I don't know weird feedback like this is preposterous. This is over the top and. Oh. Within, that, that book came out in 2010. Two years later, you could buy those things on Amazon for $35. Absolutely. Well, when, when the Raleigh book comes out and, and new fiction comes out, I will be sure to read it. And we'll sit down and talk again. Thank you. Look forward to it. Thanks for having me. Uh -huh.